Brain volume varies enormously in modern humans, ranging from less than 1,000 to more than 2,000 cubic centimeters. But the largest modern brain volume exceeds that of any known early human species to date. However, the mean Neanderthal brain volume, 1,410 cubic centimeters, is larger than that of recent humans, 1,350 cubic centimeters. But as larger bodies have larger brains, on average, once the heavier bodies of Neanderthals are factored in, any significant difference disappears. Nonetheless, taking into account body size, Homo sapiens does have one of the largest brains, proportionately. A mute cave is located north of the Sea of Galilee. The most important find from this site is a mute one, in the latest Paleolithic layers, that were later dated, using thermoluminescence, to 50 to 60,000 years before present. It has been classified as Neanderthal, which makes it the youngest Neanderthal ever to have been discovered in the Levant. A mute one is a nearly complete, but poorly preserved, adult male Southwest Eurasian Neanderthal skeleton, thought to be about 55,000 years old. With an estimated height of 1.75 meters, about 5 feet 11 inches, it is considerably taller than any other known Neanderthal, and its skull has by far the largest cranial capacity, 1,736 to 1,740 cubic centimeters, of any Neanderthal skull ever found. This makes it one of the most famous specimens of Neanderthal skulls. Like other Neanderthal specimens in the Levant, such as Taban C1 and the Shanidar specimens, a mewed one skull is long, broad and intermediate in cranial vault height, as compared with European Neanderthals and modern humans. With a large nose and a big face, a small brow ridge and small teeth, a mewed one exhibits an unusual mosaic of features, compared to European Neanderthals. Contrary to the majority of other Near Eastern, and especially European Neanderthals, its brow ridges are slender and its chin, though still minimal by modern human standards, is somewhat developed. Although a mude one is considerably taller than any other known Neanderthal, its body is stocky, robust, and has short limbs, similarly to the cold-adapted bodies of classic West European Neanderthals. Anthropologists initially interpreted these features as intermediate between Levantine Neanderthals, the Taban and Shanidar specimens, and Levantine anatomically modern humans, the Skul and Kafse specimens. Indeed, a mud one is highly progressive for a Neanderthal and has many derived traits shared with early anatomically modern humans, and even modern humans. But the Amude one facial skeleton was incomplete and fragmentary, so its assumed form has been reconstructed and measurements of the specimen, particularly with regards to the mid-face, are speculatory. What's more, a virtual reconstruction indicated that the Amude 1 facial skeleton was smaller than previously estimated, and that the cranial vault was shorter during the individual's lifetime, having been deformed in situ by geological pressure. As Pleistocene hominin crania are rarely found completely intact, the reliability of estimates of their brain volume depends primarily on the overall preservation of the fossils, and the methods used to calculate the estimations. The findings are some of the earliest evidence of a brain size that falls in the upper range of modern Homo sapiens. Scientists once presumed that the brain size of ancient humans in the Old Stone Age, from Australopithecus through Homo habilis to Homo erectus, grew gradually bigger with time. But this specimen shows that this is not always the case. Furthermore, more research is needed to help explain what led to the huge change in the brain size of our ancestors, and offer a new piece of information in the jigsaw of human evolution. And because many early hominins exhibit numerous morphological differences throughout their evolutionary history, Pleistocene hominin brain volume estimations need to consider the geological age of the specimen, among other things. For example, Shanidar 1 was an elderly southwest Eurasian Neanderthal male who lived around 65,000 years ago, around the same era as a mude 1. Shanidar Cave is about 900 kilometers or 575 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee. Shanidar 1 was aged between 30 and 45 years when he died, remarkably old for a Neanderthal. Shanidar 1 had a large cranial capacity of 1,600 cubic centimeters, was around a height of 5 feet 7 inches, and displayed signs of severe deformity. 
he was one of four nearly complete skeletons from the cave that displayed tram-related abnormalities, which in his case would have been debilitating to the point of making day-to-day -day life painful. During the course of the Neanderthal's life, he had suffered a violent blow to the left side of his face, creating a crushing fracture to his left orbit which would have left him partially or totally blind in one eye. He also suffered from a withered right arm, which had been fractured in several places. A fracture of the Neanderthal C5 vertebrae is thought to have caused damage to his muscle function, specifically the deltoids and biceps, of the right arm. Shanidar 1 healed, but this caused the loss of his lower arm and hand. This is thought to be either congenital, a result of childhood trauma, or due to an amputation later in his life. The sharp point caused by a distal fracture of the individual's right humerus points towards this theory of amputation. If the arm was amputated, this demonstrates one of the earliest signs of surgery on a living individual. The arm had healed, but the injury may have caused some paralysis down his right side, leading to deformities in his lower legs and feet. Studies show that this Neanderthal had also suffered from two broken legs. This would have resulted in him walking with a pronounced, painful limp. These findings in Shanidar 1 skeleton indicate that he was unlikely to be able to provide for himself in a Neanderthal society. As a result of the healing of his injuries, Shanidar 1 lived a substantial amount of time before his death. If the Neanderthals did perform surgery on Shanidar 1, this proves that their methods were successful in sustaining his life. Considering that all the injuries were healed during this time period, may lead to the reasoning that this individual was kept alive for a reason. Shanidar 1 must have been aided by others in order to survive his injuries. Due to all of the injuries and side effects of trauma, it was very unlikely that this Neanderthal could independently provide for himself, implying he may have been kept alive due to a high status within his society, or a keeper of knowledge. This evidence has led to speculation that the Neanderthals had some sort of altruistic characteristics, with the possibility of the presence of an ethos within the Neanderthal community. Shanidar II was a Neanderthal male, around the age of 30, who suffered from slight arthritis. It is estimated that Shanidar II was 5 feet 2 inches in stature, which places him just below the average height of a male Neanderthal. Shanidar II had a higher cranial vault, and other skull proportions that did not quite match up to the average Neanderthal skull. This may indicate that the Neanderthals of Shanidar had a morphology similar to anatomically modern humans than other Neanderthals, or that the group was very diverse. This points to similarities between the two species, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, but it doesn't show any inherent relationships within that species. These traits also share similarities to the Amud 1 Neanderthal. Lastly, Shanidar 3, who was a 40 to 50 year old male, was found in the same grave as Shanidar 1 and Shanidar 2. A wound to the left ninth rib suggests that the Neanderthal died of complications from a stab wound by a sharp implement. Bone growth around the wound indicates that Shanidar 3 lived for at least several weeks after the injury with the object still embedded. The angle of the wound rules out self-infliction, and is consistent with a purposeful stabbing by another individual. Recent research has suggested that the injury may have been caused by a long-range projectile weapon. This would be the earliest example of interspecies violence in the human fossil record, and the only such example amongst Neanderthals. Indeed, the presence of early modern humans, armed with projectile weapons, in the region around the same time has been taken to imply that this injury may have resulted from interspecies conflict with modern humans, 